Uh, my name is Nate Smith. I'm a Master of Public Policy candidate here at the Ford School. As a student with an interest in multilateral security issues, I'm privileged to serve as a moderator for today's debate on the effectiveness of multilateral agreements regarding cybersecurity. The Ford Policy Union debates are intended to bring an informed discussion of international policy view issues of importance and interest to the students of the Ford Policy School, the University of Michigan community, and the wider policy world as a part of the Ford School's mission to educate policymakers of the future. The International Policy Center plans to host one more event in the remainder of this academic year, and continue this series in subsequent years to so enrich the educational experience of students, bringing leading voices on key policy issues to the Ford School, and contribute to a wider, more informed discussion. Our debate today will be conducted in a fashion similar to a competitive forensic debate, but with the difference that there will be participation by the audience. I'd like to welcome and introduce our participants. Dr. John Steinbrenner, Director of the Center for International Security Studies at Maryland, at the University of Maryland uh, School of Public Policy. Uh, his work has focused on issues of international security and related problems of international policy. And Dr. Stephen Bucci, Director of the Allison Center for Foreign Policy Studies at the Heritage Foundation. Former Army Special Forces Officer and Pentagon official, Dr. Bucci's work has focused on cybersecurity, special operations, and defense support civil, to uh, civil authorities. This debate will be over the following resolution. This House resolves that the U.S. should begin multilateral negotiations regarding cybersecurity to establish international standards and guidelines on the use of cyber means in conflict for resolving and for resolving international disputes regarding cybersecurity issues to prevent escalation in their use. Professor Steinbrenner will argue in favor of the resolution, while Dr. Bucci will argue that only after the U.S. establishes how to address U.S. cybersecurity issues from the standpoint of purely American interests should we pursue a multilateral agreement. The audience can submit questions uh, for our Q&A period. As you came into the auditorium, you received cards on which you may submit your questions for this event. Uh, we'll start collecting these cards after the opening statements conclude, and we'll collect them until 6.30. Uh, a panel of professors and students will then collate and prioritize these questions. Uh, you're welcome to submit as many questions as time allows. Following the questions, our speakers will make their closing statements. After that, we'll evaluate the res results of the debate, taking a second vote of the audience. Uh, and this is, again, using the eye clickers that you received when you walked in uh, as to whether or not the resolution is passed. So once again, welcome to our debaters. Uh, and welcome to our ongoing series of debates. And uh, before we turn it over to our debaters, I'm going to take a quick poll. On the screen, you'll see the resolution. And I'm going to display the results here. There we go. So click on A for affirmative, B for negative, and C for undecided. Looks like we have a pretty even split oh. so far. <clears throat> and I'm going to give it about 10 more seconds or so. All right. Looks like we have our results. So after the event, we're going to take another poll uh, in the same manner and we're going to look at how many minds have been changed. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we hand it over to the debaters, I'd like to welcome Dr. Bob Axelrod, who's going to give a few opening remarks on cybersecurity issues. Thank you. So I just want to give uh, a little background and context. Uh, you may have seen yesterday's story in the New York Times that the United States has uh, established that uh, the cyber espionage that has been going on for several years at a large scale has been traced to a unit of the uh, Chinese army and therefore uh, the attribution seems pretty clear and the question uh, that the article raised was uh, is the Obama administration ready to uh, call the Chinese out on this and insist that they 
uh, scale it back or else, and then what would be the or else. So the cybersecurity issues are with us daily, um, but um, the espionage issue is one that has been on the forefront of the news media, but there's others that can come. Now, espionage has traditionally been dealt with by everybody denying they do it and everybody doing it, and then everybody, when they find some, uh, somebody committing espionage, they typically will um, uh, ex uh, deport as persona non grata any officials of the other government and then arrest and prosecute anybody else. And then the uh, government that, whose officials were declared persona non grata typically takes exactly the same number of officials on the other side and expels them. This tit for tat has been going on quite a, all throughout the Cold War and the numbers are always precise. But with cyber, uh, it's not so easy because there's nobody particular, in particular to expel or to arrest or to um, prosecute. And nevertheless, the espionage goes on. And from the Chinese side, it's clear at least that they are after three different kinds of things. One is industrial <coughs> secrets. For example, they, uh, they went after Coca-Cola. You may wonder why. Well, it was when they were negotiating to purchase uh, uh, an agreement with Chinese uh, software, soft uh, drink companies. So there were billions at stake in that. They've also gone after military secrets, of course, and uh, they've gone after sources that would help them identify dissidents. For example, the reason they, apparently the reason they, uh, they've gone after Google and New York Times and Wall Street journals are to find out in the newspaper case, when they publish stories about Chinese dissidents, who was it that provided those names and what were they? They wanted to get inside the reporters' things. But of course, cyber issues could become very much larger uh, than the espionage. They could become a part of a major conflict, either independently uh, with cyber activities being in the fore or combined with what the Pentagon likes to call kinetic attacks. Kinetic attacks are things that go boom. So those are physical attacks and of course cyber uh, activity could be part of those as well. And in the past we've seen them used by the Russians, for example, in two cases. Uh, one against Estonia where the, there were denial of service attacks and it's still ambiguous as to whether the Russian government um, was directly uh, supportive of that or whether it was sort of cyber um, patriots within Russia who were mad at Estonia. But it was also done against uh, uh, Georgia when the Soviets, uh, well, I mean when the Russians attacked Georgia. Uh, there was also attacks on their um, government and industrial system that caused some damage. The Iranians have also used cyber uh, techniques, uh, for example, to hijack an uh, American drone and have it land in Iran where they could display it and presumably sell it to the Chinese. And of course the United States and Israel apparently have, uh, have used uh, what's called Stuxnet to uh, interfere with the Iranian uh, nuclear program and it was a crossing of a threshold in terms of actually sabotaging an industrial system whereas other things have been strictly within the cyber domain. A major question is, can we uh, prevent uh, cyber conflict from uh, getting out of hand by anticipating what some of the problems are and acting in advance uh, to head those off by some kind of mutual understandings or agreements? And that's exactly what the debate resolution gets to. Uh, how, how can we go about, uh, in a cooperative manner, um, reducing the risk of uh, major cyber conflict, and if so, how, what has to be done to make that uh, even possible to start down that road? And with that, I'll turn it over to our debaters, and maybe you're going to moderate that. Do you want me to go? I noticed that Stephen has more minds to change than I do, so I feel the pressure. <laughs> um, but my answer to the question is yes, definitely, we should begin negotiations, but I want to specify with whom and for what purpose um, and set a little bit of a context. Uh, um, the Internet is, is clearly one of the most remarkable phenomena that, um, that we've ever seen. It, um, uh, it began in the early 1970s with four people who imagined um, 
uh, a network of 100,000 mainframe computers uh, in, uh, worldwide and did not fathom uh, the, uh, uh, what was going to happen. Uh, uh, they didn't understand the power of, of PCs and the consequence of what was going to occur. And as a result, um, we have basically what's become a spontaneous public utility that's ingrained itself into virtually all aspects of life. And so we are, in very, very serious ways, dependent upon the proper functioning of the Internet. And anything that threatens it is, is a serious question. Um, I do not think that we can negotiate protective rules about just everything. Um, um, but I do think that we need very urgently to, to begin discussions about those things that we have reasonable aspiration to be able to protect. Um, so what I would exclude from as, as sort of long since sort of uh, 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 out of bounds, if you will, is the entire business of espionage, um, which it's been a bonanza for intelligence agencies and marketing organizations and busybodies of all sorts. Um, uh, and it's uh, the protection against espionage is up to the users, basically, and there's not much we can do about that. Um, uh, that said, though, however, I, I think that, that we do have good reason to worry about destructive actions against um, social assets um, that really could potentially harm uh, uh, our society and all others in very major ways. And my candidates for this are power grids, financial service uh, clearing houses, um, uh, navigation services, healthcare services, emergency reaction services, that sort of thing. Um, social functions that everybody more or less believes should be taken off the board for legitimate targets of hostile attack. <coughs> And so you can base at least uh, instinctive principle that, that uh, we should not be fighting about these things. We should be protecting these things. And I think, uh, personally, I think power grids are the most um, uh, challenging and important topic. Uh, they are, in principle, uh, subject to intrusion and destructive actions. Um, it's technically conceivable um, to have massive um, uh, disruption of the power grid. Um, so my argument is that we should begin immediately to talk to the critical players in this regard, the Chinese and the Russians in particular, about fundamentally prohibiting attacks on critical infrastructure targets, power grids in particular, um, to set the principle and then discuss how we proceed to implement that principle by mutually supportive actions. The main purpose of this is prevent these major countries, ourselves including, from preparing attacks on power grids, which we are currently doing, and suspecting each other of doing. We don't want that to happen. It shouldn't happen. Um, but if it's not going to happen, um, we're going to have to work out uh, uh, mutually protective arrangements and establish the principle much more thoroughly than it's currently established. And I will sort of stop early with that, with that point. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Steinberg. I'll have Dr. Bucci give his opening remarks. Good evening. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, and I, as mentioned, I'm trying to convince you that uh, I'm not opposed, as in, no, we shouldn't ever do negotiations on the international scale regarding cyber, but uh, that not yet. And the reason I say that is this. Right now, in the United States, we have huge differences of opinion between men and women of goodwill from all over the political spectrum, uh, not broken down along partisan lines, uh, that disagree about issues of security versus privacy. Is security and privacy really, are they really the opposite ends of, of the spectrum of these issues? Uh, should we use regulatory frameworks to try and increase cybersecurity, or should we use market uh, measures to do that? Uh, who should be the lead in this area? Should it be the public sector or should it be the private sector? Some combination of the two. Uh, and again, this is not a Republican versus Democrat kind of deal. If you look at the, the bills that have been tried to uh, gotten through and have failed, every one of them has had bipartisan support 
by the people who wrote the bills, and every one of them has had very strong bipartisan opposition against them because there are actually some honest disagreements about the best way to go forward with this. Uh, before we go into an international forum to try and, and negotiate uh, with other countries who have, in some cases, very different visions of the Internet than we do, we need to figure out where the heck we think we should be. Uh, you know, I realize there might be some value with starting those discussions to help us come to those conclusions of where we should be, and I think we should have a, a conversation, but I think it should be a national conversation first, then followed by the international uh, conversation, because if you go into a negotiation not knowing what is important to you, not knowing what is critical, not knowing what's negotiable and what isn't, you're not necessarily going to come out with a, uh, an outcome that is helpful or positive for the nation. Uh, I just want to point out that there has been growing internationally a particular divergence between the United States, the Western democracies that stand with us, and other democracies of the world, and the vision that we have of the Internet, which is generally looked at as freedom, uh, free speech, um, access to all the information that's out there uh, versus countries like Russia and China and Iran and some other uh, more repressive regimes in the world who look at that and say, that's wrong. We've got to control this stuff. The people should only have access to certain types of information. Uh, we should be able to close off our part of the Internet from the rest of the world and they use it as a method of population control. Uh, you, you must remember that technology like this is amoral. You can use it for very, very positive things or you can use it for very, very negative things depending on the motivation of the people who are executing those policies. Uh, I realize that some people, particularly when they get into the privacy versus security debate, uh, many people are more concerned about protecting their information from our government than they are from anyone else. Uh, and I understand that. You know, I don't want Big Brother looking over my shoulder either, even though I make a point of trying not to do anything that might interest them. Uh, but I got to tell you, if you don't have some degree of security, there's going to be a lot of people looking over your shoulder. And a lot of them are not going to be from this country. Uh, so we do need to uh, come to that conclusion as a nation uh, you know, this is America. We're never going to work out all the details, but we got to at least get in the ballpark before we step out into the international forum and uh, start trying to negotiate with the other folks out there who I can tell you when they come into the negotiations will have very, very firm, very specific agendas that they're trying to push forward. Uh, so, again, I'm not, not a no, like, never do this ever in the world. But we need to go a little slow, and I would rather see us not achieve an international agreement if in achieving that agreement it's going to circumscribe the freedoms and the, the benefits of the Internet, not just for our citizens, but for many other citizens in the world. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bucci. Uh, Dr. Steinbrenner, if you'd like to respond to uh, Dr. Bucci's opening comments. Yeah, I'm, I'm not proposing that we negotiate about everything or we try to regulate comprehensively all Internet activities. Um, 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 I say that we should focus uh, on those things where we have very good reason to believe we have very, very strong mutual interest. Um, even if it is not uh, well articulated or realized. Uh, I think we do know already, we don't have to have a big debate, that we have a huge interest in preventing deliberately destructive attacks on power grids, for example. Um, and that, um, that I would be happy if negotiations focused exclusively on that, or I would add um, other things to this category, critical infrastructure, financial clearinghouse transactions in particular. Uh, to which the uh, international economy is extremely vulnerable. Um, 
Um, so the proposal is that, that we don't try comprehensive regulation of everything the internet does, but we try to block off extremely dangerous destructive actions that are technically feasible and for which there is no single technical solution. We need, uh, 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 secondly, I would say that we, are, we, are, we do know we have an interest in that. We do know that any meaningful action would have to be global in scope. So you've got to negotiate in order to, to, uh, to do that. Uh, and I don't think, you know, we could wait a long time before the U.S. political system gets internal agreement on anything, really. Um, uh, but there is pretty good understanding, uh, I think, I would argue, uh, that that particular piece of it, we do not want to have destructive attacks on critical infrastructure targets. Uh, we, we have reasonable agreement on that, and we, and we can begin negotiation. And let me point out the way in which we form internal consensus is in part by discussing uh, with potential uh, uh, partners or adversaries what it is that we mutually ought to do. So that's a way of driving our internal consensus. Um, until you have global protection, you don't, you don't have protection. So unless we can bring the Chinese and the Russians particularly on board with this principle, don't attack critical infrastructure targets, uh, anything we do is going to be ineffective. Thank you, Dr. Stein. Dr. Bush, would you like your Can I sit here? Is that mess yes. up, cameraman? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, we should participate in international discussions. Uh, I'm making a somewhat narrow distinction here between uh, talking to allies, even talking to adversaries, which is fine, goes on all the time, uh, and, and a formalized negotiating process uh, that's out in, in the international arena. Uh, the reason I think we should participate in, in sort of more informal discussions of that nature is, frankly, we do need to keep track of what others are trying to do uh, to, to be able to see what these, this other block of nations that, that kind of has a different vision for the internet than we do, uh, and to protect our own reputation. If you don't come to the table Sometimes you get kind of beat up by everybody else, and, and the United States ha does have to guard against that. Uh, one of my main concerns with this is, while in my heart of hearts I agree with John about the, the importance of trying to uh, keep these very destructive acts from becoming the norm, uh, the problem I have with it is it's awfully darn hard to tell a difference between espionage probing and someone rummaging around inside your network just to steal your intellectual property or your data, you use exactly the same procedures to get in, to, to do everything that you would use if you were going to go in there and do destruction. So it's very, very difficult. You know, I agree we need to exempt espionage because you're never going to control that. It's too ubiquitous. Uh, it's against the law anyway, and everybody still does it. Uh, but the problem is, while they're in there doing that espionage, how the heck are you going to tell the difference between that and when they leave something behind, or at the time they get in there, they decide to, you know, metaphorically pull the trigger and do something destructive? Uh, just getting the United States, China, and Russia to say, okay, we won't do that, uh, unfortunately, in this world is not enough. They are the biggest players. They do have the most capability of any country out there, but I got to tell you, you know, China can't control North Korea from doing nuclear tests. Uh, Russia doesn't seem to be inclined to try and keep Iran from supporting international terrorism, and the United States doesn't seem to be able to stop Israel when Israel thinks it's in their interest to do something. And, you know, these are three countries that are very closely related to those three big ones. And there's a whole bunch of other folks out there that also have cyber capabilities. So uh, a laudable goal, but uh, I just don't think it's achievable. Uh, and that's why I'm in no particular hurry to, uh, to get out there and, and negotiate. Uh, I do want to say one thing real quickly. If you have not read John's paper, well, I don't agree with every single thing in it. It's really, really well written and very comprehensive on this issue. So I, I would recommend it. He's, he's probably too modest to say that, but it's really good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to Dr. Steinbrenner, I wonder if you could respond to this, uh, this notion of 
informal versus formal talks and discerning between uh, internet freedom versus uh, what you describe, power grid security, things like that. Uh, if, what I'd like to do is try to get some sense of the texture of your, your different approaches to this issue uh, with respect to those two dimensions, formal, informal, allies, not allies. Well, what I would like to see happen is formal negotiations about a specific um, prohibition on, on destructive attacks on critical infrastructure targets. Um, uh, and so the agenda would be restricted to that. Uh, I would concede, however, uh, as Stephen is implying, that it may be very difficult to pull that off because the partners in particular uh, are not going to want to talk about the internet without also talking about political intrusion in their system. And we're not likely to agree on that. We're certain not agree on that. Um, um, nor are they going to want to talk about cybersecurity without other security topics coming onto the agenda. So I would concede that, that it is not a trivial matter um, to get negotiations focused as narrowly as, as I have suggested. Um, uh, and uh, uh, it may or may not be possible. All I'm saying is it's worth trying. Um, because in fact, the, the, I would say in reality, there is a, a mutual interest that we can play upon here. Um, uh, the three countries who are primarily involved in this, U.S., Russia, and China, are preparing uh, destructive attacks on critical infrastructure targets. I mean, we have to assume that that's going on. They haven't done it, however. Uh, and, both, and all of them, I think, have some qualms about uh, the wisdom of doing that. Um, that seems to me to create a situation where we talk, have to talk right away before they have done it. Um, and try to establish the principle, thou shalt not do what you could do. Uh, we are not going to be able to eliminate the possibility. Uh, you know, uh, the capacity is going to be there. We're not going to be able to negotiate that away. What we have to try to do is set a rule of behavior that says, this is out of bounds. You don't do it, even though you can. And you provide mutual reassurance that you're not attempting to do it. And you collaborate to, to, to sort of uh, uh, enhance the protection of, of, of our respective systems in this regard. I will concede, however, that that's... Um, you can question whether it's practical to set up negotiations as specifically focused at that without dragging in other issues about which we are not destined to agree anytime soon. And, and maybe it's not. All I'm saying, let's try. Dr. Bucci, would you agree that he's narrowed down your point of disagreement here, which is that it's not practical uh, uh, to, to get them to talk about a specific, as narrowly focused a topic uh, in a multilateral setting? Uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult because, again, I think a lot of these countries have a set agenda. They, they've settled on it. And, you know, they're, as soon as we say, okay, we want to sit down, but we only want to talk about this, they're going to come in and they might even say yes to that. But when they get to the table, there's going to be a lot of other issues that come up. You know, it, it, the thought struck me that, you know, cyber is difficult. It's, it's kind of like the uh, dual-use chemicals that you know, have perfectly legitimate you know, civilian applications, but they could also be used for something nefarious, building weapons, something like that. It's very, very difficult to monitor those things. You know, well, are they getting too much? Are they, you know, can we see that they're actually putting all those chemicals on their farm fields, vice into their munitions plants? It's very, very difficult. Cyber, you can do a lot of good things with it. But you can also turn around and, and do a lot of damage and, and cause a lot of mischief both to your own population and to the, the, the world at large. Uh, and it's really, really hard to monitor which one you're doing. And particularly if you've already stipulated, we're going to let you do espionage, or at least you know, we're going to try and stop you, but we're not going to go bomb you if you do that. Uh, when you, know, you don't know that it's destructive until it destroys something. And, and that's tough. You know, it's not the same as we saw the launch and there's something coming over the polar cap, so we now have, you know, an ability to respond. This is really stuff that, frankly, the humans are definitely the weak link in this chain <laughs> because we, we can't respond fast enough to do some of these things. Uh, it, it's, it's a scary field. And to be honest with you, all of you are the worst part of the security. Me too. 
Uh, it, it isn't the machines. It isn't even the software, though we could get better with that. Uh, it, it's the humans, and we just don't play the role that we should, and it gives adversaries a way to come in and exploit it, and they tend to take advantage of that. Dr. Steinbrenner, uh, Dr. Bucci brought up a, a different argument here. Uh, he's, he's pointing out that there's kind of a slippery slope between what we've tacitly allowed in espionage, uh, these initial intrusions, uh, between that and disabling the power grid versus stealing, for example, IP, I think you'd agree. Mm -hmm. uh, could you address that point? Um, well, just let me note that the, there is a European Convention on Cybercrime that declares as illegal virtually all the things you do, either for espionage or for destruction. Mm -hmm. So it's already been declared illegal. Um, uh, and we are parties are, uh, in some sense of that convention, I think the Russians have in some sense acceded to it as well. So already there's a, the beginning of a discussion. Um, uh, and what I would uh, uh, you know, emphasize is that uh, Stephen is correct that this looks like it's going to be difficult. Um, but that is not a reason to say a priori it's impossible, therefore don't try. Um, uh, and I do think that if we initiated um, uh, a process trying to focus specifically on what I talked to, it's, it's not clear we couldn't pull this off. Yeah, we would have to fend off issues we don't want to talk about, and that would be a problem. Um, uh, it's not clear to me, though, it would be such an intractable problem that we couldn't come to terms on what we most uh, have the greatest interest in. And we, believe me, all of us do not want to see um, destructive attacks on power grids or financial clearinghouses. Uh, particularly the latter really does threaten the world economy. If, if, um, uh, and uh, so it looks like there are deep enough interests to overcome, if you will, all the things he was rightly pointing to, and at least we ought to try to see if we could get agreement along those lines. And you don't know until you've tried. Um, uh, the United States has a lot of uh, uh, leverage here if we initiate it, because we are the big player, after all. Um, and, that, um, uh, and it's important for us, even if we don't succeed, to signal, send the signal uh, that this is the way we want the world to work. We do not want people preparing attacks or even conducting on critical infrastructure. We want to set these norms because we need these norms. And formal negotiations is a way of setting the norms, even if, even if you don't get fi final agreement. <clears throat> Dr. Bucci, I wonder if you could address what some of the downsides might be to, to entering formal negotiations sooner rather than later. Uh, I, I would assume you see a certain sense of urgency in terms of preventing an attack from on a power grid, for example, or a financial clearinghouse. Uh, but aside from the debate possibly dragging in other issues, like internet freedom that we don't feel like addressing at the moment, uh, what are the other downsides that you see? Why shouldn't we do this? Uh, the, the main reason is right now we have more ability than anybody else. And deliberately going into negotiations now and basically handing some of those abilities away, uh, while it it's, sounds like a nice thing to do in, in the not-so-nice world of international politics, uh, it's, I'm not sure there's a lot to be gained from that. Uh, frankly, I don't think some of these countries, even if you know, they sat down and signed an agreement that they would never do this stuff, that it's really going to stop them from doing it. So circumscribing our abilities and, and our uh, options when we're sort of the, the wrestler on top right now doesn't seem to make much sense to me. Let me respond to that, because this really is the fundamental issue. Um, we are better at it than other people. We're also more vulnerable. Um, sure. and, and so we're more exposed and we're better uh, uh, um, <coughs> I think our political system is having difficulty accepting the principle that it is, it is a good idea to, and need, in some sense necessary, to accept restraint in order to impose it. Um, this is an instance where we have to do that. Um, and it is true that, that uh, accepting restraint, we will put greater restriction on ourselves in the sense that we have greater capability to attack than they do. Um, I think it is overwhelmingly in our interest in this instance to do that. Um, and that's not the only instance. I mean, there are 
circumstances in which that principle uh, we do need to uh, master, that, that there are some things about which it's desirable to accept restraint on superior capability in order to, to uh, impose restraint on, on inferior capability that nonetheless can cause us a lot of trouble. Uh, would you like to respond to that, Dr. Bucci, before we move on to audience questions? Uh, I understand John's argument with that, uh, and while on an academic sense, I think it, it uh, has a lot of merit, I'm not sure that in the real world it plays out quite that way. Uh, you know, we've seen our, our negotiating skills with, with our, previously with the Soviet Union and since then with the Russians, and it hasn't always served us well. You know, we, we've had that desire to say, okay, we'll give a little bit more, we'll give a little bit more. And uh, it, it doesn't necessarily work out to our advantage. At this point, I'd like to move on to audience questions. Uh, I just got my first batch here. Uh, and the first one is for Dr. Steinberg. Even if Russia and China agree with us, the power grid shouldn't be attacked. How can we be assured that they are not preparing to do just that? And likewise, how can we assure them? Um. Well, the, the declaration that you're not going to do it is, is um, uh, the beginning. I mean, uh, they will be preparing as will we be preparing to do it. That's, that's not something we can, uh, uh, since it can be done, they will prepare and, and we do too as to how you would do it. So the problem is how do you prevent uh, people from doing what they could do and actually are prepared to do? Um, the declaration helps, it sets the norm, but I would go far beyond that. I would say let's establish uh, procedures for mutual protection uh, to make it harder to do. Um, and, and, and the art here is to target this, at, not at ourselves particularly, but at third parties, terrorists, et cetera, um, who might do it to all of us. So let's establish mutual protection against these notional third parties who might do this. Um, uh, to make it harder than it currently is. Now, that would mean that we're constraining our own ability uh, as they would be theirs, um, but we're not going to be able to eliminate the, the potential for this attack. It's going to be there. Um, what we have to do is, uh, is regulate the behavior, and the first step in regu regulating behavior is to establish a very clear norm. That <coughs> can, can I respond as well? The two, two points. One. Uh, just so everybody's clear, if you go anyplace else, but Amer you know, in America, we have a debate as to who the biggest threat is. Is it the Russians who are the most sophisticated, the Chinese who are sophisticated, and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on? Or is it the Iranians who you know, are not as sophisticated but have a lot more malice towards us? Everywhere else in the world, it isn't really a big debate. They all think we're the biggest threat because we have the most capability. And Americans hate to think of ourselves that way, but it's oh, true. The Israelis. Uh, the Israelis are, well, I mean, some of their local competitors would consider them a big threat, but that has more to do with their kinetic capabilities than, than just their cyber capabilities. Uh, but the, uh, we really need to, to realize that uh, there's, there's more folks out there in the cyber world than just the, the big countries. And, uh, it's really easy, you know, if you thought it was easy to do proxy warfare in the Cold War using other countries and special operators and that sort of stuff, it's really easy to do it in the cyber world. I mean, there's organized crime groups that get hired to do things, and some of those have capabilities that rival a lot of nation states. So it's, I just, again, I think it's a, a very laudable goal, uh, but I just don't think it's necessarily achievable. Let me just point out that the, there's a benefit in that. We are all uh, three of us, the big players, are subject to this, call it a terrorist threat or criminal threat. A and it's useful to talk about mutual protection against that, um, uh, which is easier to talk about, even though the effects are mutual protection against each other as well. Um, there isn't any absolute solution here. The only question is, can we do better than we're currently doing? Just one, one last point on that. The, the, we've had one example of trying to do exactly what we're talking about here with the, the Russians. When the United States came up with the idea of, of missile defense, 
the more recent one, not the ones when we were against the Soviet Union. Uh, and I was in the Pentagon, and we brought the Russians in, and we briefed them on everything we were planning on doing, where all the facilities were going to go. We did everything but give them the technology. And we showed them, you know, it was aimed at Iran and North Korea. It wasn't aimed at their stuff. And, I mean, we really went overboard, you know, particularly under, you know, a Republican administration to try and make them as comfortable with this as possible. And they, you know, whether they bought it intellectually but rejected it for political reasons or whether they really just didn't believe us, I don't know. But they've rejected it and they've continued to reject it and they've continued to push back against it uh, until today. And uh, so that model of offering that level of cooperation, that level of openness against what we considered a mutual threat, you know, because the Iranians, well, they buy a lot of stuff from them. They don't necessarily like them any more than they like us. Uh, they, they just weren't buying it. I would argue that's a different circumstance, and it would take us several weeks to, to work through all the details of why it's different. Okay. Dr. Bucci, the next question is for you, and it sort of takes us a little bit farther down the politic path than uh, we've even been so far. Uh, nations, nations always resort to their own interests in the end. Uh, would it not be a suitable policy for the U.S. to engage its allies on this issue, fully understanding that if a resulting treaty will be abrogated, uh, if doing so is in the national interest? Well, I mean, it's, I'm not necessarily sure that's a useful discussion. I mean. It, Nobody ever has to follow a treaty. There isn't any international policeman out there who's going to say, oh, wait a minute, you signed the paper, now you, you really can't do that. Uh, you know, if, if in the minds of the, the individual nation state, they decide that that's no longer in their interest, yeah, you're going to blow it off and you're going to do what you think is, is right. Uh, but to be honest with you, we, we kind of try not to do that. I mean, we've done it often enough, and so other people have done it just as much. But we really try not to sign up for something that we know ahead of time we're not going to follow. So I'm, I'm not sure if, if, if we have absolutely no intention of following it, that we're, it really is good form to sign up for it. It's just not what you try and do. Circumstances can change after the fact, but going into it falsely, I, I don't think we prefer to do that. Dr. Steinberg, would you like to address this? Um, just to comment, that we live in a world that is going to need global norms. And this is one of the areas of, of many where it needs it. And we're going to need to learn how to do it. Um, um, I agree. It's, you, you shouldn't, we shouldn't, we wouldn't sign up to something cynically, say, yeah, well, it doesn't mean anything. Um, uh, we're not, that's not the way we operate, or should we operate. Um, um, but. But we don't have to be completely reassured that everybody will adhere to our standards in order to try to set the norm. Uh, it's a process. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes it takes some time. And OK, people violate the norm. We catch them. And we bring them up short as a way of strengthening the norm. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Bucci, uh, you've addressed this topic uh, a fair amount um, in your writings. And so I'm actually going to address this question uh, first to Dr. Steinbrenner. But I'll Definitely give you a chance to respond. Uh, Dr. Steinbrenner, how should the U.S. continue its engagement and relationship with China, given the mounting evidence of Chinese government involvement in attacks on U.S. networks? Um, that's the reason for doing it. We want to back them off, the, uh, um, these attacks. And, and let me say that, as I think Steve pointed out, if you're in China, you hear about a lot about U.S. attacks. Um, and uh, 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 and if, you know, there's not a fair court to sort this out, but if there were, I think, uh, if people were counting attacks, if you will, the U.S. initiates most of them. Um, China may be second, maybe third. If China's third, then Russia's the second. That's, um, uh, uh, so everybody is doing it is the answer. And, and uh, uh, the fact that the Chinese are doing it is not a reason not to talk to them about this is the reason for talking to him. Uh, just, you know, first of all, and we talked about this a little before we started, you know, the, the idea of every cyber incident is really not an attack. Right. You know, the, we, we use that term very cavalierly, mostly because we've 
haven't ever really defined it well. Mm. Uh, so every newspaper person, it, it sounds much more dramatic that we had you know five million cyber attacks this week than we had you know probes and scans and, and other things like that. Uh, most of these things really are are at worst espionage. They're in there trying to steal data. Uh, our spies try and steal data from everybody else. We also steal from our friends, and our friends steal from us. So they're not just our adversaries. Uh, the, the, one of the biggest differences with China uh, is that China, like other centralized governments, support their economic interests with that information. You know, we don't go steal China's economic secrets, mostly because they're ours that they took and applied, but also uh, because we don't do that. We don't use our intel community to, you know, prop up our businesses. That's just not the model we use. Uh, other countries, and some of them are, you know, Western European countries, do do that. And uh, so there's there's a, a little difference in in the, I guess, the breadth of the espionage that goes on. Uh, they have government assets that are, is that me? Uh, maybe it is me. Uh, they have government assets that are doing industrial espionage we don't have so much that. Ours is, is national security espionage in, in the more um, normal sense of it. So, yeah, I, where you sit, it kind of depends on, on how you evaluate this. And, and if you were sitting in, in Beijing, you'd probably look at this a little differently than we do. Would you like to say anything? It, it is true that there's a, a big structural institutional difference here and that the U.S. intelligence community does not pass on its information to U.S. corporations systematically um, for their benefit, and the Chinese do. Um, um, uh, and, you know, that's just an inherent difference in the way the two societies work. Um, uh, I think it's fair to say, though, that, that we certainly gather intelligence information about Chinese uh, economic activities, uh, um, for which we, use, we don't pass it on to IBM, but we right. use it, okay, um, and so they focus on that. Uh, and both of us are gathering the same kind of information. We use it differently. The, the one other point a lot of people don't really understand, you know, we always, I, I kind of laugh at the Chinese sometimes with their, you know, it's like the lady doth protest too much kind of stuff. But, you know, that China is the most hacked country in the world by volume, by several orders of magnitude, mostly because they use a lot of, pirated software and things that don't get updated. So they're actually very, very vulnerable. Uh, and, and they're doing it to each other uh, because they've got a very large dissident community who's trying to get away with stuff and trying to protect themselves. I mean, they do have a lot of stuff. And there is some evidence that other countries like to route their stuff through China because they know once who's ever following it gets to China, they stop. Uh, and because they're, you know, everybody thinks of China as the big hacker country. Uh, so I'm not defending China by any means. They're, they're, I think they're pretty egregious violators. But, you know, again, I, it, it doesn't make much sense to get all sorts of moral outrage over it because we all do it. You know, our country does it. All of our allies do it. All of our adversaries do it. Uh, the, you know, you don't have to sneak into the Pentagon with a bag and empty out a file cabinet anymore. You just have to have some really talented people with a keyboard and hopefully someone at our end who does something stupid, which is usually what it is. It's not somebody malicious on our end. It's somebody ill-informed, I guess would be a kinder way to put it. <laughs> uh, on a similar note, and I'll direct this to you first, Dr. Bucci, uh, should the US government require non-governmental entities, such as corporations, to allow government monitoring of their networks in order to detect and to prevent attacks on those networks? I mean, there's a lot of things that our private sector could do and our public sector should do together to add protection to our systems. Uh, you know, we, the private sector gets beaten up a lot because they said, you know, they don't share their information when they've been hacked. They don't give all the data to the government because in a lot of cases, those companies consider, one, it ruins their reputation, two, it's, it's uh, proprietary information that once they hand it to the government, it becomes eligible for FOIA um, suits so that their competitors can get it. Uh, 
but on, on the same side, the government, frankly, is really, really poor at sharing information it has with the private sector. So uh, whether having the government monitor their networks directly is, is going to help, uh, they've been doing that in a defense industrial base. You know, companies sign up and say, yeah, we'll, we'll let you look at all of our stuff. You give us intel so we can protect ourselves better. And it hadn't helped that much. Uh, you know, the, everybody always thinks monitoring the network is going to stop everything from coming in. And unfortunately, it doesn't because this stuff is so innovative and so dynamic that you're not looking for certain things. You might catch some of the older stuff, but the, the newest stuff that's usually the most effective gets in, uh, even with the monitors and all the defensive stuff in place. <laughs> Dr. Steinberg, would you like to address this? No, no. Uh, okay, I'll move on. Uh, why, since we are the most capable country in the cyber realm, should we not negotiate as soon as possible from a position of strength rather than uh, when another nation has become more capable? So, I guess, what's the counter? Uh, let me just comment. The, the, there's, a lot, there's a lot of talk here about sort of uh, negotiation from strength and bargaining tactics as if the outcome were determined by relative strength. Most of the time, that's not the case. Most of the time, outcomes or durable outcomes of negotiations are, are, are determined by reasonable equity because that's what gets people to adhere to it. Um, and so usually sort of bargaining tactics and sort of leverage and all that succeeds in either speeding up or, de or, or slowing up um, the outcome that is determined uh, in terms of reasonable equity, even between countries that are, are, have very different assets. Um, so I don't imagine any agreement that is going to lock in sort of relative or, or sort of protect r relative strength. Uh, uh, an agreement that has any uh, meaning and enduring power is going to have to uh, es establish basic principles that protect everybody, um, and that's the only thing you can really enforce. Dr. Bushy, why shouldn't we argue from a position of strength? Uh, because I've seen the United States over the years negotiate, and when we go into something in a position of strength, we usually end up giving away more. Uh, so we, we end up abrogating the, the position of strength to one of, of at best, parity in some cases, depending on how bad the, the negotiated settlement is, we end up weaker than the people we're negotiating with. I'm not a real fan of arms control negotiations, so I'll, if, if you haven't figured that out yet, uh, I'll be upfront with it. Uh, I just don't think it's necessarily the, the best solution. And, uh, and in this regular, you know, like nuclear weapons and conventional weapons are a lot easier to do come to some sort of an agreement on as you can count the darn things, other than all the ones everybody hides, uh, a lot more readily than you can with doing this kind of behavioral agreement. I'm just not sure this is doable. But just let me point out, I'm not proposing that we negotiate about relative strength to trying to adjust it up or down. What I'm proposing is that we regulate behavior, um, whatever the relative strengths are. Um, and let me suggest we better learn to do that, otherwise we're in very deep trouble. Our next question, uh, I'll also address to you, Dr. Steinbrenner. Uh, if an agreement on cyber attacks is reached, but a signatory attacks anyway, how can the agreement's punitive clauses be, afford be enforced given the difficulty of definitive proof? In other words, plausible deniability is pervasive in this environment. How do you enforce? Well, one of the things you would, I mean, first of all, let me say it is, is important to establish as bright a norm as you can, even if there are violations. I mean, we have laws against murder. People get killed all the time. We nonetheless think it's important to, to um, uh, have those laws. Um, but uh, I would say that, that, that in addition to just setting the principle, we ought to establish the practice and as part of it of implementing it by, by um, a mutual um, collaboration and enforcement, and in particular in forensic uh, uh, investigation of, of possible incidents. It matters quite a lot 
whether the respective governments are contributing or collaborating in doing forensic analysis of intrusion or whether they're not. Um, so uh, the agreement would set up the, you know, the situation in which not is it, it's not impossible to violate and it might be in counter violations, but it's a lot more difficult to do it effectively without getting caught. So the point is just to make it more dangerous to whoever is doing it. And, and it, it, that, you know, with enough work, um, you, can, you can get pretty close to identifying responsibility. Um, uh, it is, you know, it is admittedly difficult, but it's, it's, it's not completely impossible. And, and keep in mind, in, in any international relations type situation, uh, you don't necessarily have to have a level of proof, you know, like you have to have in an, an American courtroom to declare somebody guilty. Uh, it, it's always going to be an assessment and that there's interests that get factored in, there's timing that gets factored in, and the, you know, if we had an agreement like this and the signatories decided that country A violated it, even if they didn't have enough proof to get it through, you know, an international court or, or a domestic court, if they felt it was in their interest to take action, to punitive action against that country, they'd do it. Um, it's, Americans tend to think very judicially, at least as a population, not necessarily the leaders, about these things and think we really, we got to have that proof beyond the reasonable doubt. And, It'd be nice, but we don't always have that before we take actions in the international realm. And your ability, should, your ability to take action depends upon the strength of the norm. Uh, you have a strong norm. You don't need sort of definitive proof in order to enforce it. it the, if, if people really don't think that, that the action is justified, you, you can do a lot of things, even if your proof is a little squirrel. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the proof will always, well, at least I think, for, at least for the foreseeable future, will continue to be squirrely. Uh, in this realm because it's, it's really hard to get that definitive proof and while our forensics capabilities are getting better and better, the techniques people use to, to obfuscate the, the responsibility are also getting better and better. So uh, it's, it's another area in cyber that's chasing itself. So with respect to capabilities, uh, we have a question here uh, regarding how the U.S. might best enhance their own capabilities. And uh, so, Dr. Steinbrenner, I'll address this to you first, but I'd like you both to comment. Uh, what would be the best means of integrating the private sector into whatever U.S. and international agreements might be negotiated? Um, one of the things I think that we ought to fairly seriously explore um, uh, is, is for um, Operating systems, infrastructure operating systems that carry a, a, a heavy load for international, uh, that we ought to um, try to establish um, basically a, a trusted bank whereby sort of source codes um, are deposited and then you can check periodically against changes to those source codes as a way of detecting intrusion. Um, and there's a lot of complexity associated with that idea. You have to be very sure about the source code in the first place, and you have to be very sure that the repository is trustworthy. It's not itself a source of intrusion. Um, but that would establish um, a, a higher standard of protection against those things that are really critical than we currently have. So that's one of the things uh, uh, I think that we ought to explore doing. Um, the other idea that people regularly have is, okay, disconnect from the internet those things that you don't want. Um, uh, that's easy to say and very difficult to do. It's very, very hard to disconnect any current operating system from the internet, absolutely, because the internet is so efficient. Um, um, but nonetheless, you can think about uh, uh, the possibility of taking the power grid off the internet in some sense. Um, and how would you do that, and could you do it? And it, these are productive discussions to have. Yeah, the, the, the idea of taking things off the internet, it, it, everybody always has this vision that there's just some switch somewhere where you <laughs> just flip it. And, and, but you know, if your adversary's intent is to lower your capability and take away from you all the advantages that you gain by using all these digital means, you kind of did his job for him when you say, oh, there's something coming. Quick, turn it all off. 
okay, he didn't have to hit you. You turned it off yourself. Uh, it's, that's, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's an unfortunately naive view of, of how it works, and it's also counterproductive. Uh, and, and I know you're not suggesting that, so yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not being critical of you, yeah. but it's just, you, right now, we are really, really good at so many things in the world, whether it's military, intelligence, commercial, because we have bought into this digital world 110%. And we're leveraging every bit of it we can find. We're using it. Even people that are relative Luddites are, you know, you're still totally immersed in, in the cyber world. Uh, and it's really hard to get off of it. I mean, somebody once said, they were talking about cloud computing. And they said, well, that Gmail is, is the entry drug of choice to cloud computing. And uh, he was being really cute, but it's, we're all addicted to this stuff, folks, to a greater or lesser degree, as individuals, as a society, uh, as a nation. And it's really hard to walk away from it, even for a little while. I know in Washington, we had a BlackBerry outage for a couple of days. And I mean, there were people, they were literally Jones and I, they were shaking. <laughs> they couldn't get stuff on their BlackBerry on the, the Metro. Uh, it, it's really, an amazing dependence on an ability to work wherever you are, to, to be in communications wherever you are, and when you lose that, it, it's hard. And I've seen it in the military. We're really, really good at using that stuff. And when you, we've done exercises where you turn it off, you know, you simulate a cyber attack, and suddenly you, you lose all that communications, you lose all that logistical capability, or management and logistical capability, you lose all the command and control, and everything stops. And finally, the head general or admiral says, okay, you made your point, turn all that back on, <laughs> let's get on with the real training. And you realize, ah, sir, don't you understand, this is the real training, because there are people out there that are gonna do this against us. So it's uh, just turning off the internet or unplugging things from the internet, we're way beyond that at this point. So that's actually a good segue to the next question, which uh, this particular audience member feels is uh, core to this debate. And I'm going to address it first to Dr. Steinberger. Uh, it seems there are two core questions. One, what should be impermissible even in war, i.e. Geneva Accords we have for POWs? And two, what should be impermissible outside of armed hostilities? Outside of? Outside of war. Outside of armed yeah. um, It's a very good question, and the the, uh, the borderline between war and not war is is getting to be an increasingly difficult question. Um, uh, what I would say is the the reason for establishing sort of legal restraints is to stay out of war in the first place. Um, uh, and then I would concede that if you really get something that qualifies as war, fully declared and all that, that most of these rules are in jeopardy, um, mm -hmm. uh, including the rules of war, which are regularly violated. Um, um, but that doesn't mean that, that that doesn't undermine their utility, if you will. It just repre it represents that if you, if you go, it, and let me be a little more specific. If we say, thou shalt not attack uh, power grids, that's an act of war. Um, um, it, and you, you establish that norm, it, it, it certainly discourages anybody um, from contemplating that because it defines that act as an act of war and it opens up all sorts of retribution um, uh, as a consequence for that. Um, so uh, my basic answer to the question is you set the norms in order to stay out of war. Uh, you would hope, of course, that they would contain any conflict that actually occurs, but if we get war, then you know there's a lot of destruction, and this is part of it. I mean, that's sort of the essence of deterrence. You 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 have a declaratory policy. You tell people what is impermissible. In this case, I think I think that's a perfectly legitimate thing for a nation state to say: you attack our power grid, and we're at war. And it doesn't matter. You know, we don't have to answer back with a cyber. Uh, weapon system, we can come back at you with everything we've got. 
Now, there's nuances to that. You know, our Department of Defense announced that a cyber attack would be considered an act of war. Now, it neglected to define what a cyber attack was. I mean, it, it was left deliberately vague. So hopefully, maybe you deter a few more things, because you don't necessarily want the bad guys to say, OK, I know I can go all the way up to here, and they won't come and bomb me. But if I go beyond that, I know they're going to come after me. So you, you do leave some, some wiggle room there, because that has a, an additional around the edges deterrent effect. But you know, it's, it comes down to them making a, a interest-based decision as well as to whether, you know, okay, we're, we're going to see if they're really going to back this up because we think it's worth the risk to, to hammer them by doing that. And, and you hope it doesn't happen. I, I think, frankly, I think having a specific declaratory policy that you attack our energy grid in any way, shape, or form and we'll consider it an act of war makes more sense to me than having a negotiation. It well, gets the, it out the corollary the to that is that, that we will not do it to you either. If we consider it an act of war, yeah. we're ruling that out of bounds. Uh, um, and you know, that, that's a way of, uh, the, the point is to set the norm. How you set the norm, you can debate about how to set the norm. Um, uh, but it would be desirable to have sort of a legally enacted agreement. This is the norm. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we've reached the end of our question and answer session, uh, but we'd like to give each of you five minutes to give some closing remarks to sum up your arguments and, uh, and uh, leave us with a, a final impression. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Steinbrunner, we'd like to start with you. And, uh, um, you don't have to get up to the podium. <laughs> Let me just say that there are deep issues. We're I mean, the cyber issue uh, connects into a lot of other things as well um, um, and cannot really in the end be... be uh, separated from fundamental security relationships and all the interests associated with that. So part of what is behind what I'm saying is that we're living in a world that is going to require um, uh, more robust regulation, if you will, of some things than it currently has. Um, and it is going to require sort of legally fine security relationships among the major players in order to cope with mutual threats. Um, Coming down the line, in case you haven't noticed, is the looming issue of global warming, which although is controversial here, um, is not going to be controversial forever. This is a very, very serious mutual threat. Um, uh, and that's going to change the security relationships of all countries over a, a two or three decade year period. And they're going to be driven into very intricate collaboration. Um, and this is just one of the features of that. Um, so what I'm saying here is the, the recommendation of this, talking about this um, is rooted in a larger situation in which we're going to have to learn um, uh, to, to regulate um, our security relationships with countries that we have historically seen or like to see as enemies for mutual protection because we have overwhelming mutual interest looming here. And we have to learn how to handle it. Uh, I just want to emphasize cyber threats are real, right? It isn't hype. It isn't just, you know, defense contractors around the Northern Virginia area trying to get extra contracts from the government. Uh, th there are real honest-to-God threats out there from nation states, from non-state actors, from criminal organizations. Even, you know, the, everybody always laughs at the hacker. You know, it's the fat guy sitting in his mother's basement typing away on his computer. Those guys still exist, and they're frankly much more capable today than they used to be because you can just go online and buy stuff. I mean, I could become a hacker, and I'm not a tech guy, if I just went online to some gray sites and, and bought some tools. Uh, so the threats are real. The sky is not falling, however. Right? The, you know, the, the republic is not at risk today of, of collapsing under the weight of the cyber attacks we're facing. Uh, it, it's, but what's happening does affect all of us. Uh, if you are like me and have either not much hair or the hair has turned a different color, uh, you may take advantage of this and say, look, you know, I, I, that's not my thing. I'm just going to do what I do, and I, I know other people are going to take care of it. That's the wrong attitude. You have to understand this problem. You have to get engaged with it. If you think that all the young people are going to take care of it for you, 
you're dreaming. The young people are very capable at using all this stuff, and they have no culture of security whatsoever. It's not a criticism, it's just a fact. That's not important to them. So they don't think about the threats in the same way someone with, with that grayer or less hair does it. So you've got to have the, the mindsets of both together uh, working to try and address this. Uh, if you don't understand the cyber issues that are out there, get the knowledge. Dig in. The government has a wonderful program that it's supposed to put out awareness, education, and training. And I spoke with one of these senior people at DHS, and I said, well, how's that going? And he said, oh, it's going really well. We have six meetings scheduled this year where the secretary herself is going to get out and talk to people around the country, 500 people in each venue. That's 3,000 people <laughs> in the United States of America. That's not very many. All right, so we've got to get this education out. We've got to make people aware because this is the world we live in now. Your parents, our, our age parents, our parents, the old, really old people, how do you think they get all their benefits from the government now? They've got to learn how to go online to get it. I mean, and it, we're just getting started. It's all moving in that direction. So this is a real thing. It affects us as individuals. It definitely affects us as a society. And, and we need to get more astute and, and more capable at doing the right things so that we don't make it any easier for the bad guys that are out there who, who are trying to do us ill. Uh, you do have a role in it. It is not just an academic exercise. Thank you both very much for coming here. Mercifully, he did not do a poll this time. <laughs> That's right, he forgot to do that. I'd like to thank our speakers again, Drs. Bucci and Steinbrenner, for coming here and engaging in a thoughtful, uh, engaging discussion. Uh, I know I learned a lot, and uh, I think that's fairly widespread here. Um, I'd like to remind everyone uh, as they head out to uh, get their M cards if they have uh, the eye clickers. And I'd also like to take one final poll. Uh. <laughs> and uh, if I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> Oops. Uh, here we go. Technology, right? Okay, so if anyone wants to try voting, ah, there we go. Okay, so our resolution is here. So, just so you can read it. Looks like we don't have anyone undecided, so that's good. Oh, never mind. <laughs> it's called skewing the boat when we just say that. <laughs> All well, once again, I'd like to thank our speakers. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to uh, invite everyone to our last debate in the Ford Policy Union series. It'll be on March 26th on the topic of international drug treaties. And uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>